subsequent failed patch attempts. So keep that in mind as we uh, talk about this here. So Bash itself is a command line interpreter. Um, so not only is it a shell for the operating system, it's also a command in of itself. Uh, and that's essentially how the exploit is able to, um, uh, to take place uh, through environment variable tampering. Um, those in the Windows world know that, you know, percent, uh, percent, 10 percent is a, uh, an environment variable for Windows. Uh, kind of along the same lines of what uh, exploitation is occurring here with the command line um, environment variables. Um, so, <clears throat> the exploit itself allows you to have full uh, remote command execution against uh, a targeted service. Um, the main difference between this and uh, SSL Hardly is that with SSL Hardly, it was a memory leak, right? So with uh, SSL heart bleed exploitation, you might be able to uh, pull uh, captured data or credentials or SSL uh, private keys uh, from the memory leak of that exploit. But with Shellshock, this is full arbitrary OS command execution. Um, so I do think that this is a much greater vulnerability than what the media portrayed over uh, SSL heart So how prevalent is this? Still same jokes from when I talked about it uh, the other day, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's very prevalent um, coming from uh, the, the action still shot of the uh, Academy Award Buddy movie, Starship Troopers. So what remote services as an attacker are you able to exploit shell-shock against? Uh, for starters, uh, the biggest one being HTTP, which, uh, which I'll show you here in the exploit demo, um, especially the cPanel. Uh, cPanel has uh, several CGI or common database based scripts that are susceptible through that environment variable tampering if uh, Bash shell is not patched. Uh, DHCP on the LAN, um, even your OS 10, uh, uh, your Mac computers were uh, susceptible to uh, DHCP exploitation, uh, but thankfully only on a local area network. Um, secure shell, uh, luckily only through authenticated sessions, uh, file transfer protocol, Oracle databases and even common Unix printing services. Uh, Mubix here, uh, another security researcher, he uh, lists um, several remote code um, for the exploit code uh, proof of concepts. So if you want to check that out, um, he, did, he did a good job of uh, combining all those into his GitHub code there. Let's talk a little bit about the attack history. It's, um, as this exploit was uh, publicly introduced into the wild. Uh, so within the first hour, that's when you start seeing the first servers compromise. That's when uh, Chris Sanders gets a call, hey man, my, my system got popped. What's man be doing for me? So um, after 24 hours, um, botnets emerged for you know, DDoS and vulnerability scanning. Uh, so one of the, the first security researchers who actually published the proof of concept code, his name was Rob. Uh, so Ms. Green set, uh, set up one of the first botnets from this exploit. Thanks, Rob, for that. Um, he works for uh, this person. Uh, some other ones that were stood up within you know, the first day or so was Wattbot. Um, this was seen attacking the uh, uh, Department of uh, Defense. And uh, most of these are uh, controlled with IRC bots that are written in Perl. The main reason why the, uh, the misgrades chose to uh, use Perl for their IRC uh, scripts is that uh, Linux, by default, usually has uh, Perl um, already enabled. Uh, so that's not you know, something in an add-on module that they would have to add to the, uh, the operating system. So generally, most of these, when we look at um, attacks in the bot, you'll see them pulling down Perl uh, IRC bot code in order for uh, you know, miscreants, uh, miscreants to control that bot. Within 48 hours, um, you know, <coughs> roughly uh, 18,000 attacks with 400 unique IPs. Uh, I believe that Capsula put that figure out there. <coughs> And then within one week, <coughs> 1.5 million attacks or probes per day, including that Yahoo that was compromised. <coughs> All right, so we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the honeypot itself and uh, how I set that up. Um, flying through these real quick, so if you need me to slow down and explain to me, please don't hesitate. So, uh, stick up your hand there. Um, so Honeypot, uh, for those not going to know, probably preaching the choir, but it's a, it's a vulnerable system to capture attacks. Uh, 
I particularly use this uh, shock pot that was uh, published by Fresh Dreams, uh, Modern Honey Pot Network. We got have the uh, GitHub link there. Uh, feeds all the uh, data back to a nice uh, Python um, Django database, I believe, and uh, you, know, you can do a, a bunch of uh, search results and everything in a nice web GUI. So that's really fun to uh, sit and watch. <coughs> So within the first uh, three hours, I um, already got my first hit. Um, so this particular misgrant, the, uh, the actual exploit code that he was, or the, uh, the exploit um, remote command that he was issuing was that wget statement that you see there. Um, there's two or three different uh, HTTP header fields that you're actually able to include within the Shellshock exploit. Um, this particular guy chose to do the, uh, the user agent, but I believe there's also the uh, refer field and I believe one more um, that you're able to send that, that exploit through uh, the HTTP. So this guy, he was uh, pulling down uh, C code um, I had in the, uh, the browser session there, uh, what the actual script looks like. Uh, so he's pulling down uh, some C code, compiling that, and running uh, that particular C code again was a, uh, a C based um, IRC client um, for a thought. And uh, that didn't work, but he's also been pulling down the Perl version there in the second line. Finally, I think he pulled out an actual binary and tried to run that as well. Here's an example of that IRC bot. Um, in the comments up at the top here, you start to see some of the commands that were capable of uh, this particular uh, botnet. Um, so not only do they have the, the usual IRC uh, commands, but um, this main uh, intent for this bot was for uh, TCP or UDP flooding. Um, mainly, we believe that these miscreants were setting these uh, botnets up uh, for the sole purpose of uh, stress testing uh, services. Um, in other words, they were just uh, setting up um, DDoS for hire uh, services. Uh, you may have heard about this recently in the news with the, the lizard squad people um, setting up their, their lizard stressor, whatever they call it. Uh, crazy kids. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this particular bot also had some pretty cool utilities packed into it. Um, it had a reverse uh, uh, connection back to its ID. Um, we were able to download stuff, uh, port scan, um, there's a spam module, um, and that's about it. This is one that I just captured recently, um, so what, a couple, about five days ago. And um, yeah, this, this guy was a little less, uh, it was, more of a new uh, version, not as it was pretty much watered down compared to the uh, one that I just last showed you. So I thought I'd go ahead and show you that. Uh, so these attacks are still occurring in a while. One of the cool things that I did too was uh, compare. So I had you know three different geographic uh, regions where I had this uh, honeypot installed, and uh, it was really neat to see the same IP address hit except uh, all three of those in uh, one set. Um, you know, within the span of like five minutes. So the breadth of their scans are going across the entire IP version four stakes on different providers, um, you know, very quickly. So we're talking about the, uh, the mitigation of this. Uh, of course, you want to patch. Um, the cool thing about this exploit is that for the vulnerability itself, you're able to test whether or not um, you are vulnerable uh, straight from the command. Um, so that's really easy. Of course, if you have any type of um, perimeter firewall, um, anything that's passing in the user agent field or the refer fields um, for the HTTP exploit, you're obviously going to catch that real quick. And that pretty much leads us to the demo. Quick and dirty, yeah? Any questions so far? Move it over to the demo. Shop. 
in order for successful exploitation to occur over HTTP for the shell shock vulnerability, you have to have a, a file in the CGI bin directory that exists on disk. Um, so from there, uh, the exploit escapes out of that, um, that environment using environment variable tampering, and then from there uh, allows you to execute both command, uh, command execution. Um, what I have in the background here is uh, Wireshark, so I'll actually capture that traffic and I'll show you what that user agent looks like with that exploit name. environment variables? Is right, that's correct. So in order for uh, successful exploitation to occur uh, for the exploit, um, it has to be a legitimate file within a CGI bin. Right? 
So in the wild, if you go back and uh, anyone who has a website here today, I bet you if you go back and take a look at your access logs for like two weeks, you'll see multiple scans for your CGI bin directory. So what they'll do is scan that directory for known CGI uh, files. Once they get a 200, they automatically send uh, the exploit payload for your shell shot. And uh, generally, you can even see those in your access logs because they'll show up in user agent or uh, refer to. Sir, that question. Are you totally susceptible to shell shock if you visit the wrong website or something? Phones? Are you totally susceptible? You know it? Not that I'm aware. Um, of course, the breadth of this uh, uh, exploit is, you know, just recently been realized. Right? Um, so we haven't really scratched the surface. Uh, it's been introduced in the code since 1989, so who knows what is. But uh, the good thing about it, though, especially with um, some devices, you know, you hear of Linux running on pretty much everything, including your kitchen toaster. Um, the good thing about it is that some of your, you, you know, your smaller dumb devices, they're running uh, BusyBox, which fortunately is not a full bash shell. Uh, but once you start to get into more of your uh, Soho, um, higher end commercial uh, devices, they're going to have that full Linux stack that has Bash on it. So yeah, luckily your you know, residential routers more than likely are just running uh, busy bugs. So thankfully they, they were not susceptible to 